title of my paper is uh, Josiah Royce and the Forbidden Biography. When Josiah Royce died in 1916, he left no written instructions for the disposition of his papers, posthumous publications, or biographies. However, his wife Catherine and his sister Ruth insisted that Josiah had told them that he wanted to be remembered solely by his published works and that he did not want his private life revealed. Subsequently, Catherine and Ruth did what they could to fend off curious scholars. Jacob Lowenberg, a true disciple who might have hoped to be Royce's biographer, noted with palpable regret that the biography was forbidden. It must be borne in mind, Lowenberg wrote in 1920, that an account of Professor Royce's life will probably never be written. Mrs. Royce has declared that it was her husband's wish that his personal history should not be published. Ruth Royce, in a letter to Ralph Barton Perry, summarized her brother's aversion to biography. She wrote, A man's biography is of use to the world only insofar as it helps to interpret his written message. Family matters, relationships, private life, personal matters the world is not concerned with. The real man is the spirit and not the temple. He writes his own biography and when he records his gr the gradual development of his thoughts. Would you know the man? Read his message. His growing messages throughout the years. The rest is only incidental and temporary. At first glance, this may seem curious, for Roy seems to have, a, have had a, a, a general, generally curiosity about the private lives of the great thinkers of the past. On the other hand, it is hardly surprising that someone might want to ferret out the secrets of others while keeping their own hidden. <laughs> Indeed, there were many secrets in the Royce family that they might want to conceal. Royce's father, for instance, was a bizarre individual, an eccentric religious fanatic, a hopeless dreamer who failed at every enterprise and plunged his family into poverty. Two sisters had horrible marriages. Mary was married to an alcoholic, uneducated laborer who fathered 11 children, seven of which survived. They, too, lived in dreadful poverty. Harriet was divorced, worked as a secretary and a seamstress, was always unstable, virtually indigent, and depended upon Josiah for financial and emotional support. As for Royce himself, he seems to have been afflicted with a bipolar disorder. In 1888, after more than five years of intensely cre intense and creative work, he suffered a major crisis. So serious was this breakdown that he had to stop teaching for eight months and take as a cure a long sea voyage alone to Australia. In later years, perhaps fearing a relapse, he took uh, he took shorter versions of the same treatment, brief summer cruises to the Caribbean. A far darker family secret was the mental illness and early death of their eldest son, Christopher. Incredibly precocious in both music and mathematics, he graduated with honors from Harvard at the age of 18. But the signs of a progressive and eventually psychotic disorder were evident even before adolescence. Though he was a model pupil and a quick learner, his teachers complained that he was habitually tardy, sometimes dreamy, absent-minded, lost in his own thoughts. When nine, he was treated by a Boston physician for nocturnal enuresis and a variety of behavioral problems. As a young man, he was unable to hold a job or maintain social relationships. And when he became uncontrollably delusional, his parents had him admitted indefinitely to Danvers State Hospital. Christopher died in 1910, only eight, 28 years old. Problems continued to vex the Royce family. The second son, Christ, uh, pardon me, uh, Edward, married the beautiful, talented, but high-strung first cousin, Elizabeth Randolph. 
only three months after Christopher died. A year later, their first child, Randolph, was born with catastrophic brain damage. The young parents were unable to care for him, and so it devolved upon Catherine to become the child's surrogate mother. Randolph was never able to speak in sentences, and when he was nearly 40, having become wild and uncontrollable at home, he was finally committed to Westboro State Hospital. Edward and Elizabeth had marital problems for almost from the start. They were divorced in Reno in 1922. So Royce, his wife, and his sister had reason to shield the family from inquiring biographers. Indeed, they could have appreciated Oscar Wilde's saying, biography lends to death a new terror. <laughs> Catherine was particularly vigorous in denying scholars access to sensitive documents and refusing permission for posthumous publication. Lohenberg remembered that she wanted to destroy the acrimonious correspondence between Royce and Hugo Münsterberg, chiding Perry for his for his emphasis on the feud between Royce and James, their so-called battle of the absolute, Catherine complained about the gloomy bits that I dislike and you cling to like a puppy to a root. Anything she considered negative, emotional, or, or improper was taboo. When Daniel Mason asked for permission to publish letters that Royce had written to him, his brother, and his sister-in-law, she flatly refused. In these letters, Royce was acting as a counselor in a delicate family matter. Dan had fallen in love with his brother's wife. Although the letters revealed nothing about Royce's family problems, Catherine denied Mason's uh, re re repeated requests. Both Josiah and I, she said, have always had the very strong feeling in favor of privacy in all matters of strictly uh, personal and emotional concern. He wished me to use my influence against the publication of other sorts of things he might have written. Mason entrusted the letters to William Ernest Hawking, who considered them too sensitive for publication, kept them locked up, and when he died, Hawking's son, Richard, did the same. Finally, I, with Frank Oppenheim, managed to publish these important fresh insights into Royce's work and character. Catherine Royce did not, however, maintain this stewardship with perfect consistency. Four of James's letters to Royce appeared in the 1920 edition of the Letters of uh, William James. Catherine, or possibly Josiah before his death, must have entrusted these letters to the editor, William son, Henry. Perry published excerpts from these and other letters between Royce and James in the 1935 Thought and Character of William James. All the surviving correspondence between the two is preserved in the James papers at the Houghton Library. Persons whom Catherine knew and whose discretion she trusted were granted exceptions to her rule of privacy. Lowenberg edited and posthumously published Royce's lectures on modern idealism, and in fugitive, in fugitive essays, he was, allowed, he was allowed to quote from Royce's thought diary and to print four previously unpublished essays. Furthermore, Lohenberg, Perry, and Hawking helped to set up the Royce Papers in the Harvard Archives, a rich collection of unpublished material that illuminates much of Royce's professional as well as his personal life. The principle, therefore, that Royce wanted to be remembered solely through ideas con contained in works published during his lifetime was compromised from within the, the, the two decades that followed his death. These trusted friends and disciples did not, of course, divulge the family secrets. Perry, for instance, although he had all of Roy, the Royce James correspondence, including the letters that described Christopher's sad history, never mentioned it. Perry said that he also had access to Royce's personal diaries, and he quoted passages from some of them. Unfortunately, these documents have disappeared. We know that Royce also kept an extensive diary during his recuperative voyage to Australia. Stephen Royce, who persisted in his mother's policy of secrecy, said that she had, he had seen these beautiful but sad reflections, adding that he intended to give the diary to his son or destroy it. This fourth-generation Josiah told me that he had seen the diary, 
but he did not own it or know its whereabouts. And when the family, the family papers were finally retrieved from Stephen's office building in Michigan, the diary was missing. Writing to Clifford K. Shipton, custodian of the Harvard archives in the 1940s, Stephen refused to, to, to deposit private papers because he disapproved of the present surrealist, surrealist form of biographical and historical writing, a sort of keyhole peeking. He definitely hoped to thwart this snooping would-be biographer. Correspondence concerning family illnesses and such, he wrote, are the last thing that my father and his family would ever want published or pawed over. It is not surprising, therefore, that before the 1950s, little was available to understand the inner life of Josiah Royce. James Harry Cotton in Royce on the Human Self in 1954 included a brief biographical sketch. Cotton was also one of the first scholars to use the Royce papers at Harvard in order to get beyond the published works. Ten years later, Vincent Burinelli, a literary scholar, published Josiah Royce, one of the first volumes in the Twain United States Authors Series, a modest but useful study based solely on published materials. Limited in the same way, Josiah Royce, 1967, by Thomas F. Powell, an historian uh, in the Great uh, American Thinkers series. Also in 1967, another historian, Robert Albert Wells, completed a doctoral dissertation at Boston University, Portrait of Josiah Royce. Wells was the first scholar after Perry to use unpublished letters in a narrative of Royce's life. In 1962, Bruce Kuklick published Josiah Royce, an Intellectual Biography, a sequential analysis of Royce's mature thought, but not a story of his life aside from his philosophy. Kuklick's The Rise of American Philosophy treats Royce in relationship to other Harvard philosophers, and most important, the reverence for the relations of life by Frank M. Oppenheim is a study of Royce's relations to oh, Peirce, James, and Dewey. When, as a young scholar, I entered the world of Royce studies in in the 1960s with my proposed edition of the um, letters of Josiah Royce, a host of new problems confronted me. Catherine, Ruth, and Stephen Royce were dead. Stephen's son, Josiah Royce, was very cooperative, but he was often unavailable because as an officer abroad in the USAID program, he was living in India. Randolph's legal guardian was no problem, but his sister, another Catherine Royce, who, like her brother, was confined to a mental hospital in California, had a court-appointed conservator who proved difficult. Eventually, I paid for a court order to obtain permission to publish his papers. Then I encountered David Royce, another son of Edward, though by a second marriage, who dreamed of floating with profits from his father's royalties across the Atlantic. He wrote me on letterhead that advertised the Gulliver Project. And when I asked him what that meant, he said he hoped to set a record for hot air balloon travel. Claiming uh, an infringement of copyright, David prevented the University of Chicago Press from publishing John McDermott's edition of the basic writings of Josiah Royce. To obtain his permission to publish my edition of the letters, David caused me to pay modest sons to him and the other heirs, a total of $200, as a kind of down payment on expected royalties that, of course, never materialized. <laughs> the missing cash of Royce papers, uh, private papers, is another story. I knew that when when Stephen moved his mother from the residence in Irving Street to the Kirkland Rest Home, he took the bulk of what was left, personal diaries, incoming correspondence, family letters, and memorabilia, and stored them in Crystal Falls, Michigan. Eventually, he hoped, uh, pardon me, evidently he hoped the world would never see them again. When I finished my biography in 1985, I assumed that these papers were lost forever, either accidentally or deliberately destroyed. Three years later, the new owner of Stevens Building, in a bit of random housekeeping, surprised everyone by discovering the missing documents. 
important material now fortunately a part of the Harvard archives. This discovery led to my revised biography of 1999. Contrary to Stephen's fears, the revision enhanced by those dreaded intimate letters presents the whole family, especially Catherine, much more sympathetically. In many ways, it is a tragic story, but as Royce understood, suffering and sorrow are vital sources of spiritual redemption. The next biography of Royce will, I predict, be a revisionist account of his life and a more critical analysis of his philosophy. It may, for instance, hold Royce to a higher standard with respect to the issues of race, class, and gender. Although I have generally maintained that Royce lived the life that his philosophy defends, being an exemplar of loyalty, harmony, and triadic communal values, he had his share of flaws. He wrote passionately against racism, yet in a private letter about dining room service at a meeting of the American Historical Association, he wrote, and here I cannot avoid the nasty language. He wrote, Saratoga niggers swarmed like big black flies in the, di the vast dining hall of the hotel. They waited on no one in particular save when they received unheard of fees. They grinned and chattered and we ate what we could find. Repeatedly, he spoke up for women's rights, especially in education. But when it came to voting rights, Royce could only make a joke of it. On March 1st, 1912, British reformer Emmeline Pankhurst threw four rocks through the prime minister's windows and was sentenced to nine months in jail. Soon afterwards, while in England, Royce wrote, a suffrage outbreak seems imminent, but I shall try to avoid feminine wiles and stone throwing. The evasion of Cuba in, 19, in 1898 elicited a similar wisecrack. When a group, and when a group of school teachers, Cuban school teachers, were invited to Harvard for a summer school in 1900, Royce wrote that they gave a very weird seeming to Harvard Square. And against the fence leaned not only the mucker and the job, and the jobless working man, but also the wide trousered little swat swarthy Cuban, destroying cigarettes and gesticulating with his loud conversational voice, harsh and shrill, often made the square seem like a bird store when the parrots are lively. It will be the responsibility of this future biographer to weigh the importance of these crude, but isolated, and even aberrant remarks and place them in a context that is both honest and fair. As a social history, this biography will treat Royce's attention to social issues in his time. It will assess his works in relation to such writers as Jacob Rees, Thorstein Veblen, W.E.B. Du Bois, and Jane Addams. And most importantly, it will bring him into the 20th century.